And welcome to the protection event, an evening of education and inspiration. Thank you to the Crown Heights parents for coming out tonight. This event was coordinated, endorsed, and funded by all of the schools in Crown Heights and all of the schools that are serving the Crown Heights community. Every single Moisid. This itself speaks volumes to the importance of the matter on hand. Operation Survival of NCFGE, led by Rabbi Yaakov Bertman, partnered with us and is also a sponsor of tonight's event. Thank you to all the Crown Heights schools. Thank you, NCFGE, for making this protection event a reality. We give special thanks and appreciation to Base Rifka for initiating and hosting tonight's event. With that, I would like to introduce Rabbi Shalom Goldstein, the Executive Director of Base Rifka, with opening remarks. Good evening. Shleima Melech and Kehelis says a very famous pasuk. Masha Hoya Hushiya, Masha Nasa Hushiya, Seve Ink Kol Chodosh Tachas Hashemesh. The challenge that we're here today to discuss is the challenge of life. In these past few days, Alter Rebbe and Tanya Perikudveis discusses. The Avoida of the Benini, which is Avoida Kol Yimei Chayav. It's the struggle. That is the Avoida. This past week, in Shemais, save for Agula, Moshe Rabbeinu is in the wilderness, in the desert, and he sees a curious incident. He sees a burning bush. The Kaitzim, the thorns are burning. And in Enu Ukal, they're not being consumed. He turns. He's not sure what to do. The Pasuk repeats itself again that Abisha tells Moshe Rabbeinu to turn. And then he tells him, Shal, Noalecha, Malaraglecha, Ki Admas Kaydeshu, take off your shoes, connect to the ground. It's a holy place. What is this holy place that the Ebesher is telling Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu is looking at a situation where there's Aish, there's fire, there's Avaz Hashem, there's Yir Hashem, there's a tremendous Ratzin to do the Avaid Hashem, but there still is that thorn, and the thorn is not disappearing. So the Ebesher turns to him, tells him to come close, tells him to connect, and tells Moshe Rabbeinu that this is the Kavana, this is the process. This is the kavona of the dear b'tachtoinim. This is avoda kol yimechay of the avoda of the benedi. Moshe Rabbeinu responds to the Abishter with three responses. The first response Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Abishter is kvad pe, kvad I'm unable to. I don't have the tools to succeed. Moshe Rabbeinu gets an answer from the Abishter. Aaron is on the way. He'll take care, he'll help you, you have the tools. The second answer Moshe Rabbeinu gives the Abish there is that they're not gonna, they, the Yidin aren't going to listen to me. They're not, it's not, I may be able to, but I won't be able to affect. I may be able to do, but I don't know if I can affect. Says the Abish there, he's going to give you the tools again. He gives Moshe Rabbeinu two ISIS. After showing the Meishe Rabbeinu the two Isis, Meishe Rabbeinu says, Shlach no I may not be able to finish the job, so why don't you get, give it to the person, to Mashiach, who's going to finish it? And the Abishu tells Meishe Rabbeinu to continue and to do it, and uh, the start of Gula starts then. This message is the message that we're sharing here tonight. You may ask, or may think to yourself, 
This is way too large. It's not something I can fix. The answer is the Abishter put you in this generation as a parent. You have the ability. You have the tools. You may think, you may tell yourself, it's difficult. They're not going to listen to me. My kids won't be able to appreciate it. If you say it, if you say it with confidence, you might need one method, a second method, multiple methods, but you'll get through. And the third question, which is the real question, is if we're not able to fix this problem, why start? And the answer is, is that if we want to be able to get the ultimate redemption in the Gula Amitis Rashlema, we have to start. If we start the Gula, if we jump in it, like Moshe Rabbeinu did, wholeheartedly we'll be able to be successful. This also ties into today's Hayim Yayim. In today's Hayim Yayim, <coughs> there's a discussion brought down three times in Hayim Yayim about the idea that Yiddish Gashmias is Ruchnias. Our job is to take Gashmias and change it over and use it and make it Ruchnias. In today's Hayim Yayim, the Hayim Yayim finishes off saying that there are times that you don't have the full Gashmias. You don't have the ability to give the full Gashmias to give gift to the Ebishter. So in that, if that's the case, take what you have, whatever writes in Aim Yayim, even give the little bit, the Minchas Oni, and the Ebishter will reciprocate with a full hand, with a full hand and give us the tools to take this beginning of Gula and make it the Gula of Amitis Vashlema. Thank you, Rabbi Goldstein. A few years ago, on Gimel Tammuz, I was sitting at a Ferbringen. There was a Shliach Ferbringen, and he was analyzing the Hayyam Yayim of the day of Gimel Tammuz. Hayyam Yayim of Gimel Tammuz reads as follows. A Yiddish Shekrecht, was kund chas v'shalom b'siba fun anit gud kashmi, is oich at shuva g'dayla. Befrat a krecht b'siba fun anit gud ruchni, is avada and avada at shuva mal yasa. Der krecht schleppt a reis von oimekra und stelt a nidar in a maimitayv. Which translates, even when the sigh of a yid is occasioned by an unfavorable material circumstance, chas v'shalom, this too is a significant act of teshuva. All the more so, a sigh due to an unfavorable spiritual situation is most certainly a lofty level of tshuva. It drags one out of the depths of evil and sets them up in a good place. After reading the Hayyam Yayim, the Shliach asked the following question. While this Hayyam Yayim seems to attribute so much value to a krecht, to the sigh of a yid, there is another Hayyam Yayim that seems to completely dismiss the value of krechtzing, of sighing. The Hayyam Yayim of Yur Adar Sheni reads as follows. Toiva pu'ula achas me'elef anachos. Eloikeinu chai v'toira u'mitzvois nitzchim hima. Azoiv es ha'anacha. Ushkoid ba'avoida b'payol v'yechancha elikim. Which translates, one action is better than a thousand sighs. Our Hashem is alive and our Torah mitzvahs are eternal. Abandon sighing. Apply yourself diligently to actual Avaidah and Hashem will be gracious to you. So he continued to resolve these two Hayyam Yayims by providing the obvious explanation. That in order for there to be change, first there needs to be the sigh, the krecht the dissatisfaction with our current state. The yearn for change is a must. There is a tremendous amount of value to it. But needless to say, if you just remain with that feeling of disappointment or discontent, you won't get too far. Afterwards, action is a must. Toiva pu'ula achas me'elef anachais. One action is better than even a thousand sighs. Like it says in a third Hayyam Yayim that we recently learned, the displeased feeling is just the doorknob that unlocks the heart 
and opens the eyes so that one will not sit with folded arms and will take action. Parents of Crown Heights, we have all been sighing. Anyone who I speak to, and I'm sure anyone who you speak to, is sighing. People are struggling. People are disappointed. Some people are frustrated with this challenge that technology presents to us. This is a challenge for all of us, all of us, adults and children. Tonight it is time that we, as the Crown Heights community, we unite as one and we put the sighing behind us. And tonight, we take action and make change and take steps in the positive direction. Tonight, we will reflect on the reality of the challenge and get educated. We will be inspired to connect to our families and to the people around us, to raise our children and to protect them, to take at least one step in the right direction and create positive change. Toiva pu'ula. Achas, to educate us and empower us with this enormous, complicated, and ever-evolving challenge we have with us Dr. Eli Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is the creator and director of the Digital Citizenship Project. He possesses expertise in both educational matters and mental health issues. He delivers impactful parent presentations all around the globe on navigating the digital age. Personally, about 10 years ago, I heard Dr. Shapiro speak at one of the sessions at the Kinnis HaShluchem. His message about the responsibility and the ownership that we must have when it comes to technology and our children and ourselves left an impression with me and remains with me until today. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Eli Shapiro. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say, just to start with, it, it's so remarkable, looking around this room, the, the crowd that's here and the ability to put together all the schools here in Crown Heights is remarkable. So really give a round of applause for that. That's... Uh, when we were uh, you know, discussing the, the program for tonight, I, I, I didn't really want to speak on technology. I, I really wanted to debate with Rabbi Shapiro, whether a C should appear in the name Shapiro or not. So if you'd prefer to hear that discussion, um, we could do that. Um, can the, we put the PowerPoint on the screen? Is it up? It's up? Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, just to begin with, uh, really just uh, really remarkable to put a, a crowd like this together. And the theme of protection is to reflect, to connect, and protect. And I'm going to try to go with this theme as well. Um, because it really is a very thoughtful approach. And to start with reflection, we need to understand that technology, uh, it's not just about the internet, it's not just about, it's not just about the content, but it's really about technology and our relationship with technology as a whole. Just by a raise of hands, how many of you have experienced what we call phantom vibrations at some point in your life where your body's vibrating but your phone's not with you? Just me and a few of the guys. You know, you know what I'm talking about? All right, okay. Um, yeah, so that's an amazing thing that really underscores um, our relationship with technology and how enmeshed it is that we're literally experiencing physical symptoms as a result of it. Uh, a study found that 89% of people experience phantom vibrations. Um, just so you know, if, if my reputation preceded me, that there are a lot of statistics and data in my presentations. Um, some of my audiences say that there is too much data and statistics. Actually, about 72% of my audiences say that there's, there's too much data and statistics. But I really feel it's important that data should inform what we do. Uh, it shouldn't just uh, define uh, next steps, but it should inform. Uh, if, if it's defining next steps, my, my brother-in-law, when he was expecting his fifth child, he decorated the baby's room in an Asian theme uh, because he read a study that every fifth child born in America is Asian. Uh, so that's, that's using data the wrong way. So we're going to try to use it in a, in a more responsible and thoughtful way. 
Um, so I like to say that we live in the best of times, we live in the worst of times. Uh, it's just an amazing uh, times and opportunities that we live in. We have uh, with technology accessibility, we have productivity, we have information, we have connectivity, all these wonderful things and wonderful opportunities uh, that technology presents. I, I actually really feel that the connectivity piece um, is, is so uh, wonderful these days. I actually have a grandson who lives in Eretz Yisrael, and the ability to see him on video uh, is, is just amazing. Um, I know what a lot of you are wondering is, is how can a guy so young have a grandson? Um, I wonder that myself sometimes. Um, but the answer, the answer is moisturizer. Just That's a beauty tip for tonight. Moisturizer. Um, I happen to like L'Occitane with 5% shea butter, just like under the eyes. It's a little beauty tip. Keep it between us. Um, but no, it really is amazing. Technology uh, gives us such opportunities, but it's also the worst of times, and it's impacting us socially, behaviorally, psychologically, and day to day. And in order for us to benefit from what technology has to offer, we need to understand and reflect. Closer? Yeah. Uh, we need to understand and reflect on how technology is impacting us. So the first thing is to have a, they, they say in re the recovery model, to take a fearless moral inventory. Um, of our habits. And so when it comes to technology, um, I do have a confession to make. If you want to join me in this confession, that's, that's fine. Um, I happen to love technology. Any, anybody else? I see a few shy people. Okay, okay, okay. It's, it's pretty amazing. The world loves technology. We are living in a world where technology is ubiquitous. It's so enmeshed in our lives, as we said. We experience phantom vibrations uh, as a result of that relationship. In fact, one study found that six billion out of the world, seven billion people owned a mobile phone, but only four and a half billion people had a toilet. So when we think about the priorities, what is it that is important to people, clearly uh, the technology is more important. We, we also have a, a generational disconnect. Do you ever get the sense that your kids know more about technology than you do? I know, I certainly know I do. Like the kids, right, they, they just know more. Um, I like this text between a mother and child uh, your great aunt just passed away, LOL. Why is that funny, uh, David? What, what do you mean? It's not funny. Mom, LOL means laughing out loud. Oh my goodness, I sent that to everyone. I thought it meant lots of love. Now, you're all laughing, but we've all been there where we didn't quite get the lingo that the kids are using today, right? Everybody know what FOMO is? Okay, excellent. Fear of missing out. Okay, good. So you're a little bilingual. But the, the kids today just need, seem to know so much more than we do. And we do have a challenge, but I will say this. We do have some advantages over our kids. Uh, our kids do not know what this is. Um, they, they don't know what this is. Although in most Chabad communities, they tell me it's a pushka. So I don't know. I don't know what that's about. Um, they, they certainly don't know the relationship between these two items. I can see some of the younger parents in here don't know either. Um, all right, let's turn to someone older, they'll, they'll explain. But we do, we do have a generational disconnect, and it's so important to understand that generational disconnect because much in, in the similar way that we had Jewish immigration in the early 1920s, um, and we really had challenges in that time frame where the parents were speaking Yiddish and the kids were speaking English. And that language barrier created an assimilation process where we lost a lot of people uh, to assimilation. And so similarly today, we have that challenge as well, where our kids are digital natives and we are digital immigrants. And the challenge of understanding their language, are we speaking the same language or are they speaking digital and we're still speaking uh, Yiddish? Not that there's anything wrong with speaking Yiddish. It's that out there. Um, but that, that's something that we need to think about um, when it comes to our need to understand where our kids are today when it comes to technology. So the impact of domains that we're seeing are behavioral, uh, social, psychological, day-to-day. -day. In the behavioral sense, we see impulsivity, disinhibition, compulsivity, those behaviors of our relationship with technology. How many times do we check a phone or do we check a device without getting a notification? Any time that there's a space with nothing happening, we just reach for the phone. Or maybe we're in the middle of a conversation and we reach for the phone, right? That's part of the dynamic. That's the, the behavioral relationship that we have with our technology. Socially, how has our social experiences been impacted by technology? Are we distracted? Are we connecting with one another in, in a real way, in a meaningful way? Um, are we uh, tethered to our devices? 
Um, socially, are, are, are we going out more? Are we spending more time on screens? Psychologically, what's the relationship that we have? This is all part of our own reflection that we should be doing with technology. Is our anxiety elevated? Are we happier as a result of technology? Yes, it brings a lot of opportunity and a lot of great things, but what's it doing on the other end? What's it doing to our emotional well-being? And on a day-to-day -day basis, to what degree are we engaged with technology in contrast to things that we should be doing? So we see these impacted domains. And we see this through different screen-based activities. And a lot of it is neither good nor bad. Um, news, media, those are things that uh, you know, we need to connect to. I was, I was thinking recently, um, Nosebol Javero and watching the news uh, coming out of Eretz Yisrael and, and, and connecting with that and feeling that experience. But also, it also has a negative impact on my well-being and it's depressing and, and for a lot of people and teenagers in particular, uh, it can have a negative impact. We have social media, which in theory, social media was supposed to be a good thing. It connects like-minded people, it gives us the opportunity to share ideas, um, but that's also part of the problem. It connects like-minded people and gives us the opportunity to share ideas. You know, and if you look at it, you know, there's the positive and negative all in the same arena. Videos and entertainment, gaming, kids are playing a tremendous amount of video games. Um, and it's immersive. It's not the Atari 2600 that we grew up on with that orange button and the joystick. I mean, it's become a lot more immersive, the experience, it's social, um, and kids are spending a lot of time with that. Adults are spending a lot of time with that as well. Um, shopping, commun communication, um, shiurim education. You know, uh, a lot of us, um, we, we crest. We said Ive when uh, we had a be online during COVID and, 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 uh, and uh, distance-based learning, but what would it have been like if we didn't have that, if we didn't have the opportunity to connect? So even on every positive, there's a negative as well. And work, work as well. You know, there are a lot of people that um, tremendous opportunities come up. Um, remote work, being able to live in a community and, uh, that you want to live in and still work. Um, there's a lot of research coming out now on the challenges that remote work presents on people's subjective well-being and their overall happiness. And so it's finding that balance, reflecting on our experience and our relationship with technology uh, is critical for us to be successful with it. So we have to ask ourselves questions. How do we use technology? Is it something that's thoughtful? Do we think about it or are we, are we approaching it as a, a, a cognitive, as a, a thoughtful approach? Is it strategic? Is it deliberative or is it impulsive? Is it compulsive? Is it distracting? Is it something that is enhancing our lives or is it something that's serving as an intrusion in our lives? Just the device itself, you know, I'm reminded of a story um, about the Rebbe, a, a woman named Hannah Sharfstein came to meet with him and she brought a tape recorder with her. And she wanted to record the conversation, and she asked the Rebbe permission to record the conversation. And this is in the late 1950s. And he said, I don't want to record the conversation, uh, not because of the content of the conversation, but because just having the tape recorder on the table is going to serve as a distraction. You're going to be thinking about the gears. You're going to be thinking about the tape. You're going to be thinking about the batteries. And you're not going to be present in the moment. And this is in the late 1950s. And what we see today, all the research is telling us the level of distraction that technology is presenting. The mere presence of a smartphone on a table reduces cognitive functioning. They've done this in numerous studies, business studies, academic studies, social studies, not the subject, but studies on socialization. That idea, are we connecting? I am not connecting with you if the phone is there. If the phone is present, I am not connecting. What does that mean to our homes? to our environment, to our families, to our children, to our spouses. The mere presence of the phone serves as a distraction. We may not feel it, but it's there. We know the research is telling us that we're just not as connected. And so there are strategies for that, and we're going to talk about that. But we need to ask ourselves a question fundamentally every day. Is technology enhancing my existence, or is technology serving as an intrusion in my existence? And if we are impulsive and compulsive and we're not strategic and deliberative, inevitably it's going to end up being an intrusion rather than an enhancement. 
Another fundamental question we have to ask ourselves when we reflect is, are we role models for our children? Parents are the number one influence of what children think is appropriate with technology. My wife is a, is a uh, kindergarten teacher, and she can tell the parents that are engaged in technology by what the kids do with the blocks in the block center. The kids that pick up the block and do this and are doing this during playtime, the, they're modeling the parental behavior. This is what they're saying. My wife had uh, an assignment um, where the girls were going to write, my, my mother, my mommy likes to, and fill, fill in the blank. So some said, my mommy likes to make potato kugel, my mommy likes to daven, my mommy likes to Instagram, was what one of the, the children wrote. And my wife debated, should I send this home? Should I share this with the parents? And she did. And the parents' response was, she knows me so well. And so are we serving as role models? We are the number one influence of what our children think is appropriate. So what's the first thing that happens when they come home from school? Are we on our phone? Do we say, just give me a minute, I'm on my phone? Or do we put the phone down, put the phone away, say, I'm so excited to see you, I'm going to put the phone away and give you the attention, right? So these are the things, from a reflection standpoint, this is what we need to think about when we are engaged with uh, technology. Connect. Are we connecting? Uh, in our communities, with our families. A recent study found the average American spends seven hours and four minutes a day uh, on a screen. That's the average American. Uh, Forty percent of one's waking hours is in front of a screen. And so the Surgeon General did a study on this, and he was looking at the epidemic of loneliness in America, and he found that um, in the last 15 years, people who reported having three or less close friends jumped from 27 percent to 49 percent. So we almost doubled that people are reporting they have less friends. The amount of time that people are spending with friends went from 30 hours a month to 10 hours a month. Why are they spending less time with friends? Because they're not going out as much. They're not connecting as much. They'd rather stay home on a computer on a screen. But what's really scary is the next statistic. The next statistic is that people are spending five hours less per month with their immediate household members. So it's not just that they're not going out. They are on screens, they're in front of computers, not engaging with their family members. UCLA did a fascinating study where they took middle schoolers and they measured their ability to read facial expressions and social cues, which is the foundation for human connectivity. That is the basis for how we connect with one another. And they got a baseline and then they sent them to sleepaway camp without any technology. And they measured throughout the summer to see where things were going with these kids. And what they found was, after only five days without technology, their ability to read facial expressions and social cues and form meaningful connections with their peers vastly improved after only five days. So this study, which has been replicated numerous times, tells us two very important things. Digital technology is having a negative impact on our connection with our family, with our friends, but we can also improve it by taking breaks from technology. So when is it that we connect best with our family, with our children, with our spouse? When is that? Shabbos. Why is that? We don't have the technology distraction. For us, we have that opportunity to be able to compare and say, hey, this is what it's like when I'm not distracted with technology. But we don't have to wait till Shabbos to be engaged with our family. We can't put our phones down. We can't put our devices away. Uh, in my own home, we do something called going dark for dinner, um, which I recommend. It's a great thing. Go dark for dinner means that during dinner time, 15, 20 minutes a night, no technology. Dedicating 15, 20 minutes a night. Try it you will see a, a significant improvement in your relationship with your children, with your spouse, your communication, and your connectivity within your home. It's very simple. Try it. If, if 20 minutes is too much, start with five minutes and see how that goes. And process it. Reflect on it. Connect. When I go out with my friends, we go out to a restaurant, uh, we do something called the, the phone stacking uh, technique. And uh, we stack our phones so we can connect with each other in a meaningful way. Whoever grabs their phone first has to pay for dinner. That's that's what we do. Now, I, I happen to have one friend who's completely addicted to his phone, so I invite him every time. And, yeah. The importance of connecting socially is so important. And again, we have the opportunities uh, within a from community. We can go to shul. We have so many. We have simchas. We have, we have an extend, uh, extended community. Just, but just to put it in uh, practical terms, the Surgeon General found that lacking social connection is as dangerous as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. That doesn't mean if you have good social connections, you should start smoking. That's not what the data is telling us. 
Um, but it's, it's so important that we connect and the technology is really serving as a impediment to our ability to connect. I want to talk about early childhood for a minute just because it's so critical. We tend to think about teens and technology, but I think even more impactful, um, you know, when, when a teen, it reminds me of the study um, that, um, that six out of ten parents are concerned about their teenagers' technology habits, but eight out of ten teenagers are concerned about their parents' technology habits. So a teen will say, oh, my parents are even more addicted than I am. But an, a, a child under five years old can't say that. All they know is they're not connected with their, with their parent. And so I, I feel like this is, uh, uh, you know, kids are, are being confused. Preschool development, we see attachment, regulation, dependence, learning, all being impacted. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics says under 18 months avoid screen time and two to five years under an hour a day. And I want to tell you two things. One is, uh, and this is a dynamic that's changed significantly over the last 20 years. It used to be when you take your two-year-old to the doctor and they would get a shot, the parent would pick them up, they would rub their back, they would make them feel good, they'd feel connected, right? They're learning from this experience that my parent can connect with me, make me feel better, and when I'm stressed, when I, I'm in pain. What happens today when that same two-year-old goes to the doctor with their parent and they get the shot? What does the parent do? They give them the phone. What is the child learning? They are learning that when I'm in pain, when I am distressed, a screen can make me feel better. And that concerns me a lot more than the teenager who uses the phone because this is being imprinted on them, um, that relationship. And a recent study found that 87% of kids under five years old are exceeding uh, the daily recommended screen time. And so when we think about our, our younger kids, the idea of just putting them in front of a screen. Uh, a parent once told me, they said, I know I shouldn't be putting an iPad in my baby's crib, but it gives me an extra half hour of sleep, so what am I going to do? We need to, again, reflect and we need to connect. We also need to protect, and one of the things that we see here tonight, there are tremendous resources. Everyone should take advantage of the resource fair going on outside. There are so many tools, so many useful tools to utilize to help you manage uh, technology effectively in your home. It's always surprising to me that a parent is willing to spend $1,200 on a phone for their child, but not the $9 a month to manage the device in an effective way. Think about that. We're spending so much money on the devices, but are we managing them effectively? And we have opportunities. The tools are here. There are dedicated people. Yomam Valila spending time following what's going on with technology and creating solutions for you. And it is, there are so many that are out there right now. I'm always asked what is, the, I think, the biggest challenge with technology today, and I think it's self-regulation. Self-regulation is, is, is the biggest challenge. Because um, when it comes to all the things I mentioned on the reflection piece, impulsivity, disinhibition, compulsivity, it's all about regulating our behavior. And we have a hard time with that when we're not thoughtful, when we're not deliberative. When we make little steps to change those behaviors, we can make a big difference. For kids, the challenge is that they can't self-regulate. They're not able to self-regulate uh, their behavior. And so when it comes to um, steps that we can take, we talk about the parental modeling, we talk about um, our role as parents. So some of the things that we can do um, in our own homes um, that we can take. So bathroom first. Now this may sound funny, bathroom first. When you wake up in the morning, I've surveyed many people, and the first thing they do is they check their phone. Before Modani, you know, before Natila Sudayim, before they go to the bathroom. So bathroom first basically means you're going to delay checking your phone for about a minute and a half, two minutes, right? Nothing's going to change in that minute and a half, two minutes except your self-regulation, except the power, the dynamic that you have with technology. That's one small step we can take. Shut down for shul. Shutting down for shul, not having your device in shul. It's always surprising to me uh, when I see, uh, you know, I, I would say during Chazara Sashat's people uh, on their phone scrolling, but sometimes I've even seen during Shimon Esrei um, checking emails. Um, I know I, some of the women are probably wondering why would you have your phone while you're davening? Not your husband's. Um, in, in the five towns where I'm from, that, that's what happens, but it's, it's not your husband's. Um, but shutting down for sure. First 30 minutes home, the first 30 minutes at your family's home, just dedicate 30 minutes. You can go on your phone, you can check your devices. You will not miss out on anything important. And it will be, it will be freeing for you to feel that experience. 
go dark for dinner, we mentioned stacking for social, hold off for Havdalah. This is something that I do. Um, holding off for Havdalah means when you come home from shul, sometimes Havdalah is not ready yet. And sometimes it takes five minutes, ten minutes, sometimes things are going on. Um, wait, wait to check your phone. It's a challenge sometimes. They say it was like when people who used to smoke cigarettes, uh, you know, the whole shop is you can go not smoking a cigarette, not a problem. The second it was time, uh, you know, uh, for say, you, you had that all of a sudden you needed the cigarette. Similarly with the phone, I think we experienced that. So holding off for Havdalah is another step you can take. And show your children, demonstrate for your children, make it transparent, make it clear. We are going to wait until after Havdalah until we check technology. Set those rules. Sleep for success. The research is very clear on how technology um, impacts sleep. Uh, you know, looking at devices before bedtime impacts melatonin. They did, Harvard did a study. I mean, I, I shouldn't quote Harvard anymore. It's a dangerous. It used, there used to be a hush of institution called Harvard, and I used to cite a study where they looked at reading an e-reader at bedtime and reading a book at bedtime, and of course they found that reading the book at bedtime, you know, you fell asleep, and reading, and I actually have a book on my nightstand I've been reading for the last eight months. Yeah, and I'm only on page two. Yeah, so... Um, don't engage the rage. There's something about technology that makes us rageful. You know, someone says something we disagree with, and it just escalates so quickly. People get very angry. Here's, here's another thought. Uh, no one's opinion has ever been changed by a comment uh, in, in a group uh, chat or something. It's not like someone makes a political statement or a, uh, a, a you know, some statement, and you say, no, you're wrong, and this is what it is, and they say, oh, I didn't think of it that way. You know, thank you for clarifying. That doesn't happen. Um, so I think one of the biggest, these are just some tips and tools um, that you can utilize in your own homes. Uh, I think one of the, um, the biggest challenges for parents in managing technology is, is FOMO, is fear of missing out, and BE. BE is not Be'ez Rosh Hashem, although it, it could be. Um, BE is, but everyone has. But everyone has is a big challenge. And what's remarkable about what everyone has, in most cases, everyone does not have. Uh, all it takes is a few phone calls to clarify that not everyone has it. But even if that is a concept, I love the fact that so many schools are coming together and coming together as a community because you can establish what the norm is. You can say this is what our norm is going to be. No smartphones until whatever grade you determine. Put a committee together. Have the conversation. No social media until if there is. These are the policies. These are coming together on these issues is going to influence what the social norms are, which will also influence what your child is asking of you. A lot of kids uh, are experiencing anxiety today. It's, it's escalated to a, a pretty impressive uh, level. Uh, the the uh, diagnostic criteria for anxiety is excessive worry, intrusive thought, fatigue, emotional distress, irritability, difficulty sleeping. Um, I just found it interesting that you can replace the word anxiety with parenting and it's, it's the exact same thing. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that I found is that um, we have a disconnect between what we think is going on with our kids and what's going on with our kids. I, I surveyed thousands of parents across the United States. 91% of parents report having set rules in their house. 91%, which is a very, very impressive number uh, to have set rules in your house. But when we ask kids, are there set rules in your house, only 41% of kids um, say there are set rules in their house. 89% um, of parents report having conversations about their children using the internet responsibly, which is also a very, very impressive number. Um, but only 31% of kids uh, say that. I think you see where this is going. 22% um, of parents report that their kids have been disturbed by an online image or video, uh, but 63% of students say that they've been disturbed by an online uh, image or video. And so these are things that we have to have in mind. And I think where the disconnect is happening um, is really a communication issue. Um, but if it's okay, um, I always felt that if my public speaking career didn't work out, I would be a mentalist. Everybody knows what a mentalist is? I can, right? Okay. Um, so if it's okay with you, we'll do a, a quick mentalist ex exercise. It's interactive. Is that, it's okay. I'm going to do it anyway, but if you validate me, I'll feel better about it. Yeah? Okay, we're going to do it. All right. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to do my magic mentalist hand move, which is this. Uh, you're going to respond when I do that, and then we'll see um, if I have 
the right answer. Okay? No, it's not. It's not okay. 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 All right. Okay. What is one plus one? Can I get a round of applause? Very. Important. Some of you are skeptical. Okay. Your child comes home from school, and you say, "How was your day?" I heard good. How was your day? Good. Horrible. What? No. I heard some good. I heard some fine. Can I get a round of applause? All right. The really good parents, you're not going to let your child get away with a good fine. You're going to follow up with that ever-important question, what did you do today? Can I get a round of applause? So what's happening is we're having a disingenuous conversation, and I think that's where the disconnect comes from. So most importantly, rule number one, we have to have rules in our house. The rules can be what we talked about. It can be going dark for dinner. It can be the first 30 minutes home. It could be agreed upon rules about smartphones or social media. It could be no devices in your bedroom. It could be a shut off at uh, 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whatever the rules are. You have to have the rules. Only 41% of kids say there are set rules in their house. Rule number two, and this is really important, discussing the rules. Sometimes parents have rules but fail to tell the children about what the rules might be. So we have to discuss the rules with our children. Uh, rule number three, um, we have to keep the rules. That's the hardest of the three rules. Uh, so one, have the rules. Two, communicate the rules. Three, uh, keeping the rules. Another tip that I think is so important for parents, uh, you have to know the devices. If your children have access to a device, I'm not even talking about giving them a device. That's a whole separate piece. If you're giving them a device, what you need to know. But the devices that are available to them in the house, you need to know how they work. Um, and again, we have resources here for you to, um, to be aware of. You need to know the content that they have access to. And most importantly, you need to know your child. Every child is different. They're, what may be upsetting and distressing to one child is, is nothing to another and vice versa. We need to know our children's relationship with technology the same way that we reflect on ours, we need to reflect on our children. Children that have social anxiety and anxiety or depression are more likely to develop an unhealthy relationship with technology, and we need to be aware of that going into it. So um, six suggestions for family success, and with this I'm going to close. Uh, postpone, postpone, postpone. As long as we can, as long as we can limit, that is the ideal practice. Um, don't worry. It's not like they won't figure it out when they're 30, how to use a smartphone. Uh, they'll figure it out. Screen activities should be age appropriate. I'm not saying to never use a screen, but look at the research. Under five years old, it's strongly recommended not, but we should make sure that the content and what they're looking at and what, how they're using it is age appropriate. Have clear personal and family rules. Like I said, um, you know, shutting down for shul, I, I have um, a personal rule. During chakras, when I'm wearing towels and tefillin, I don't have my phone with me. I keep it in my life. There's no need to applaud, really. There's no, okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, no, the truth is, the truth is, uh, you know, Talos Tefillin, I don't have my phone with me. The good news is that my chakras is down to six and a half minutes, so that's working out well. Um, so having clear rules. Model healthy technology behavior. We as parents, if we want our kids to do something, they will mimic us, they will copy us. We need to demonstrate and, and be transparent when we're setting limitations around that. Promote non-digital activities. I can't stress this enough. You can't just say, don't go on a screen. You have to provide them with non-digital activities. I recently paid an obscene amount of money for a hockey stick for my son. It was ridiculously expensive. But he loves hockey, and it keeps him playing hockey. And so that's the investment we need to make in our children. If your child has an interest outside of a screen, promote it and support it. Um, and ongoing communication um, is a must. Ongoing communication is a must. You know, we're approaching... Uh, Yud Shvat, in less than two weeks, a Fria uh, wrote in, uh, in Basi Lagani um, that the antidote uh, for Shtustaluma Zeh, right? Shtustaluma Zeh, the antidote for that is Shtusta Kedusha. And technology is an opportunity for us to utilize it in a positive way, uh, to use it for the benefit, to use it for proliferating Torah, for learning, for connection. And that is where we should go from here, to utilize it at night like tonight, following up with our schools, with our community, to utilize technology for positive. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. There is so much to reflect on what you were saying, and so much resonates. Every part that you were going through, like I'm like, you know, maybe I'll share something about that slide or something. You know, it happens right here in our community with our children, our parents, but uh, we'll be here all night if I uh, reflect on all of that. But that all resonates. One of the things that we may all be feeling right now after seeing such a beautiful presentation, we might be feeling a little overwhelmed. Like there's so much to do, there's so much to understand, there's so much to conquer. How are we going to do this? And sometimes when we feel that way, we say, that's it. This is, you know, this is today's generation. This is today's kids. It's a huge challenge. No one's going to ever stop this. Filters don't work. Rules don't work. And we just give up. Chas v'shalom. But that is a natural feeling that we could have when we feel a little overwhelmed and we feel like there's so much on us to take care of. But tonight is Chav Chesteves. And in the Tanya of Chav Chesteves, the Alter Rebbe finally answers the question that he asked on the very first page of Tanya. Why, before the neshama comes down to this world, the shvua that they give the neshama is a double lashon. Tehi tzaddik, ve'al tehi rasha. You should be a tzaddik, don't be a rasha. Obviously, if you need to be a tzaddik, you can't be a rasha. So in tomorrow's Tanya, tonight's Tanya, Chav Chastevis, the Alter Rebbe explains, not everybody will make it to the level of a tzaddik. A tzaddik is an extremely high level. A tzaddik got rid of his yitzhahara. A tzaddik doesn't have the struggle anymore. He doesn't have the temptation anymore. It's not hard for him. He, he, he won the war. It's over. He's an Eved Elikim. Eved Hashem. Eved Elikim. Not everybody's going to reach that level of being a tzaddik. So we tell the neshama, Ti tzaddik, strive to be a tzaddik, aim to be a tzaddik. But at the same time, we know not everybody's going to be a tzaddik. But at least, at least, the al rasha. And the Alter Rebbe explains that we have the Bechira. And yes, we do have the power. We could control our Machshav Adibar Ramaisa. That Shvua that we get before we come into the, down into this world, Tihit Tzadik, the al rasha is saying, it is in your power. It is in your control. And we could do this. And I want to share that I believe that there's a hidden bracha in this technology challenge as there is in any challenge that we may face. So I would say, I'm just going to throw out the number, 20, 30 years ago, the Frum community started struggling with teens going off the derech in larger numbers. And if you look back to 20, 30 years ago, I think there was one message that you kept on hearing, whether it was from the Rav, the Mashpia, the Rabbi, the Mechanech, the therapist, anybody who was in any position of influencing people and speaking to people about this challenge. Everybody said, listen, if you want to keep them home, your Shabbos table has to be a beautiful place. Your Shabbos table has to be a place that they'll never want to not be part of it. They'll always want to be there. You can't have that Shabbos table where you're always correcting everybody, how they're sitting, how they're chewing, what's missing, what wasn't done right. You don't know the Dar Torah, I want you to read it louder, better. Of course, there's a place for parents to train their kids how to eat properly and to serve their parents and to help, of course. But it can't be all about that. It can't just be about the stress and the bickering because then, of course, what's attracting them to this? So the Shabbos table has to be a place that's full of chayis and kedusha and varmkait and love and you're present and you're available to your children and you're celebrating Shabbos and you're celebrating what they learned in class that week. Yes, and of course, there's, you know, there's some things that you need to address normally. And a lot of families took that to heart. And the Shabbos tables, for the people who took that to heart, are a lot better. So while 40, 50 years ago, parents were able to get away with having such a Shabbos table, it probably wasn't ideal at the time, but it worked. They got by. All of a sudden, we're starting to lose people at our table. No, 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 we can't do this anymore. We have to change what our table looks like. Well, I'll give one more example. A lot of people, their mornings are very stressful. They get up late, they get up last minute, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, and they're, you know, perhaps even screaming and yelling at their kids to get dressed, get ready. Their kids have to get dressed on their own, whether they're 9, 10 years old, maybe even 3, 4, they put their pressure on them, and everybody's kind of just like uh, making it out the house last minute. And for some families it works. They've been doing this for a lot of years already, but every day they do that in the morning and 
kids are out of the house and they're on time to yeshiva. Then you have one kid, it could be your fourth child, it could be your fifth child. This kid is allergic to being rushed. If you rush this child, it just does not work. There's fireworks, you're not going to get anywhere. You try again, you try again, and everything you've been doing for the last five years is just not working anymore. So what do you do? You change. You set your alarm for earlier, and you get up, and you're dressed before the kids, and you're downstairs before the kids, and you say good morning to everybody, and you help them get dressed because you have time, and you're patient, and you're available, and you're present. And what happens is not just that kid who needed it because you couldn't get away with it, the whole family is a different family right now. The mornings in your house are completely, completely transformed. And I think the same applies to this technology challenge. Those of us who chas v'shalom give up, those of us who just say, you know, this is too much for me, I'm never, I'm never going to be tihit tzaddik, I can't do this, then, you know, chas v'shalom, we may pay a price. I, I wish no harm on anybody. But those families who take Dr. Shapiro's presentation seriously, the rules for family slide, the different tips, the role modeling, so, so, many, so many amazing points. And we take them all seriously and we apply them and we start doing them. Even one hachlata right here tonight. Or you go out to the resource sphere and you stop at one booth and purchase what they're offering or maybe it's not even a purchase. And those, these fa the families that we, the young parents here, the parents here in this room, the families that we're going to raise with this technology challenge, if we overcome this challenge, I think we're going to have a generation of the most beautiful families that we've ever seen. There's no two ways about it. And for our next speaker, I'd like to call on somebody who's passionate about this point, about the connection part, about connecting to our families, being there for our children, being available, being a role model. Rabbi Remy Shapiro, he's the one without the C? With, with. Rabbi Remy Shapiro, Shliach in Bayside, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Let's be honest, a lot of people ask me or any of the other people involved, how does Rabbi Rami Shapiro from Shlech in Milwaukee land on this? Well, Rabbi Shapiro is on Shlechus for 19 years. He's the director of youth in Lavavich of Wisconsin. He runs a Gan Yisrael. He works with many teenagers, including Lubavitch teenagers who have come by to be the counselors, whether it's Bachrim or girls. Over the last year, he's been to over 10 different Masiftas and girl high schools. He speaks from the heart. He's very passionate about this, and he's been successful in creating positive change, and that's the message that we have tonight. So we have no one better than Rabbi Avrami Shapiro. Chaim, Chaim, it's water. Tonight's Chof Ches Tevis, I think 144 years ago, the Rebbe Zechana's birthday. So say Lachaim, I'm good to bet there. Everything we're doing tonight should be uh, her source. Lachaim. You hear me? All right. So, that speech is somewhere. Here it is. So, I'm going to start off, I'm going to share something with you. I actually have a uh, small, of small problem. I have an obsession with Diet Coke. And I like Diet Coke, a lot of Diet Coke. I drink it on a regular basis. And I try really hard to avoid it. One day, I had a meeting at the Bavich House in part of Milwaukee, and I had the 20 minute drive to go somewhere. So I figured I'm going to stop at a 7 Eleven and get a Diet Coke because if I was niched, the 20 minute drive, whole way. Driving there, I have this voice in my head. Remy, what kind of chassid are you? Get some water. Have, what do you have to drink? You know it's not good for you. Guys, stop. And I say, what do you mean? I'm thirsty. I'm going somewhere. I'm having this discussion back and forth in my mind. It wasn't working out too well. I see in the distance a 7-Eleven. And I tell myself, no, no, no. I hear my wife's voice in my head saying, stop it. Drink water. It's better for you. Still didn't work. I pull right into 7-Eleven. Right beside me, Pulls in a van. This van, I'll just describe it, I'll describe it a little bit, is a 12-passenger van with windows on top, and it looked like a garbage can on wheels. It was a, a nasty-looking place. It looked horrible and horrid. Out walked four people, two girls and two guys, walk out. 
and they walk next to 7-Eleven's uh, pizza shop uh, called uh, Papa John's, and they walk in there. The fourth one is straggling, and let me describe what he looked like. The tattoos on his face were everywhere. It wasn't even, it was just, it looks like someone got shit gear and just went on his face. He has hate on both fingers. He looked decrepit, and coming out of his nose were two spikes. I don't know what got into me. I say to him, Shalom. He tells me, Shalom. I say, uh, you're Jewish? Yeah. Where did you go to school? He started listing off the Lubavitch Moist that he went to. Moist that he went to. And we're talking back and forth. He said, well, what happened to you? I end up here. He says, well, I ended up, I went to Israel after school, and I got involved with drugs, and I'm hanging out. I came back here a few years ago, and I joined a band. And I tell him, no. He tells me, that's what I'm doing here. So I tell him, I mean, I first I lost a word. I said, let me buy you a ticket home. There's an airline called Midwest Airlines at the time. They said, let me buy you a ticket home right now. No, no. I'm, I'm the drummer. You have no instruments, for drummer. He hires a kite. And I tell him, please. And I'm pleading with him. Finally, he says to me, you know what? I'm not going. So I tell him, I have an idea for you. Let's put on filling. He says to me, okay. I take out, I don't have a confession to make. I was pushing nervous. Stuff was crawling in his hair. I took out my filling. I, I helped him with the filling. His rabbi, I got this. Like a bacher, made the bracha, everything. He goes, he, he makes it, he does his, he puts, puts, puts the Shema, does his thing. At the end, he says, you know what, Rabbi, I make you a deal. I'm not going to go home, but I haven't called my mother in a very long time. I'm going to call her right now and tell her I did a mitzvah. He goes, he has the Nextel phone, takes out his Nextel phone. He calls his mother, Ma, it says his name. I did a mitzvah. It lasted two minutes, the whole conversation. He slams the phone shut, and he leaves. And, and he finishes the phone, he comes back, takes off the tefillin. I say to him, please, please, last chance. I'll, I'll buy you a ticket. I get benched. And this went on. I left. I moved on. I got my Diet Coke, uh, guilt-free, by the way. <laughs> and, I, and I went on my way. So five years later, I am somewhere. I almost want to avoid the city. And in walks a guy who I know knew this person. I said to him, by the way, you ever know of this guy I described him? He says, yeah. No one knows what happened. The guy went off the deep end. But one morning, a couple years, a few years ago, he walks back into his house. He gets help. He's in rehab, and he's putting his life together. And I'm like, uh, he went to get some more sushi, and he walked away. But I'm standing there stunned. And why am I starting off with the story as cute as it is, as Kakarpatas as it is? Parenting is a very, very hard job. Sometimes we think parenting is a job, that we have to do the big thing, the amazing thing, the wonderful thing, instead of doing the right thing. I learned an important lesson that day. The right thing has to be done no matter when it is. Today I had a very interesting course. If my voice is shot, I'll tell you why in a minute. I spoke to a lot, eight or nine different groups of children. And at the end of every class, every talk, I spoke about some boys, some girls. I asked them for some advice. So give me advice what to tell parents tonight. And I'll be honest to you, for the sake of all of our faces not turning red, I'm not going to say most of them. And it's being recorded, so I don't want to say that either. But the kids were extremely honest. I asked for surveys. I said, hands up if you have X, Y, and Z. And I thought they'd be more embarrassed, I'd be shy. Not at all. It hit me right in the, right in the face. As a parent, you know, more different than anyone else. I, can, you know, I, I give a couple. So tell me something your parents should know. All right, so I'm giving you some of the better ones. I'm going to be very honest here. I'm giving you some of the better ones. When I call their name, please look up. When I come home, they have all day to be on the phone without me. Why do they have to wait till I come home to be on the phone? These are the better ones. I, and I thought to myself, and the kids are describing this situation. In every class, I spoke to about nine, and I had the same questions. And again and again. And then, then I did a survey. I said, how many of you have cell phones? I raised your hand. How many of you have this? Then I said, how many of you feel like your parents ignore you when they're on their phone? About 85% of the kids raised their hands. And I, I was thinking to myself, I had a whole speech planned. I really should just take the recordings of what the kids said and share it. But I, so how do we deal with this issue? I want to share one more thing. The past years, I've been in many, many high schools, seminaries, and yeshivas. And I want to say something, and I want to be super honest, because I feel like I'm leaving tomorrow, I can say what I want. 
Think of the worst thing in your mind that our kids could possibly do. Just think of it. It's happening. I don't want to try to throw a cold water, uh, just ruin everybody's day, but it's happening. Whether it's drinking, whether it's everything else. And 95% of it doesn't start in our homes. It starts in their hands. It starts in their hands, their ideas. So sometimes when I leave schools, one well, of the first question I get asked when I speak in even high schools, the girls always say to me the same thing, or whether it's girls, please ask the staff to leave. If not, we're not starting. And they, not that the teachers care. The teachers are wonderful, but the kids have a list of things. Let's clarify. The staff are amazing. I'm just giving you an example of how the kids were the thinking. So I was thinking to myself, what can I share? So I want to put forth three ideas. Three ideas that I've seen myself that actually work. And with God's help, we take one of them, it should be good. The first one is the hardest. I asked the following question to the kids. Ready for this? The last question. How many of you feel your parents are hypocrites when it comes to the phones? 97%. I think everybody but one kid who didn't hear my question raised their hand. And this is every single kid. I said, what do you mean? He said, you tell, tell us what to do, but they don't do it themselves. You know something? My kids... Never question Kostras. Recently, we were in the airport. My kids were hungry. And they, we went to the cafe. They went to the place to buy something. And there was potato chips. Punked in my family. We don't eat the, only eat the, the, the Jewish brand potato chips. Now, one of my kids, they were hungry. They were starving. Now, one kid even asked me for it. And I asked myself, like, why? I figured out why. Because <laughs> they know that's my standard. They know I'm not going to lie to them. That's where Tati lives and Mommy lives. So they don't question it. My kids never question Shabbos. My kids never question things that I actually keep. But when it comes to my phone, oh, they question, they challenge, they push, they nudge, because we all, most of us at Baisai are hypocrites. We expect something from our kids. I'm not even referring to simple things as time. What we watch on our phones, what we look at our phones, when we take out our phones and we go like this with our fingers, what, 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 what? what? The kids don't know. The kids, the kids all of a sudden fell off the moon. Our kids are a part of us and they stand good and well. And they stand good and well what's going on and they think most of us are just selling them. Because if they believe, if we, they don't question our kashras. They don't question these things because they, they know we believe it. It's a subconscious and conscious. You can lie all you want to your kids. and I can lie to my kids. Sorry. Testing one. I don't know. Oh, it's back. I apologize. Did I offend somebody? I'm not used to this community. I don't know. We can lie all we want to our kids. They're not going to buy it. And I'll tell you firsthand what I heard from different high schools, from boys, from girls, it's there. So the first thing I want to share is take care of ourselves. You know, number one, any parent in this room who is walking, not have a filter on their phone, for themselves, what the kinder, ourselves, how in the world do we think for a split second the kid's going to buy it? We want to protect them? How many of us had, I asked the kids today, how many of you, they're all complaining about filters. I said, how many of your parents took you for a walk and explained to you why there's a filter on your phone? No, they just tell us filters. I said, what do you mean? I took my kid on the phone, I explained to him how she made the world, and I made, and you have a conversation, explain to them, the bachrim are even simpler, explain them, kinalach. This is the future. This is your Yiddish guy. This is our family. Explain to them the filter. And by the way, I told the kids today, I news for you. You have a problem if you told the boys. Talk to your tati. What? Yeah, your tati struggles also. They were all shocked to find out that the tati also struggles with the phone. We have to, number one, stop the hypocrisy. Then it's, 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 This is ground zero. You know, I made a, a chlata with my kids. I made it myself. Uh, a year ago, I know, I felt bad. I mean, I thought to the what? Any gem video that pops up on my phone under three minutes, I have to watch. So I'm laying with my kid, and the, I don't know, we're watching something, and the gem video pops up. He doesn't question it. Not even once. You know why? Because he knows I keep the achlata. He knows if a gem video pops up, I got to watch it. That's my rule. Under three minutes, I have to watch it. So the first step is, is living in this world. You know, most of us, especially the guys know, when you turn around, you watch your kid dive in a fashion ministry, he didn't find it because of something else. He watches the fashion ministry, he the fashion ministry because of us. When our kids act a certain way, 95% of it is us. 
I know it's maybe controversial, but we have to be open with our kids that we struggle. It's okay for them to, I'm not saying tell them every fight that we had with our spouse, but that we struggle. Like mommy and tati also have filters on their phones, because why? It's not okay for you, it's not okay for me. And I'm telling you, I've seen it with my own kids, but I've seen it with, 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 with teenagers. There's no, the biggest, the biggest lie detectors are our kids. They don't buy it. You know, you, everyone can leave here, you know, cook does a good, I had a jacket, I go to shul. At home, we're at home. You know, they think, the kids today with the boys, we got into a fun discussion. Why is our parents, I'm sorry for being so grub, spend so much time in the, in the base like say? It's a discussion. And the kids are saying, yeah, we know what our father's doing. This is a, a, a public conversation. We know what people are doing. Yeah, they put it. I found it afterwards. Like, I'm knocking on the door. What do you think is going to happen, I say? Like, we can't, we can, we can fake everything else. We can't fake this. It's in our hands. It's in our kishkas. It's in our hands. So step number one, honesty. I know it's hard. I'm sorry and th th that I'm saying this. It's just that on them, the whole video you saw before, uh, Dr. Shapiro's every word is amazing. It's, you can select all delete if step one is this. If we try to implement anything we just saw behind us, it's not going to work. Step two. I was at a Shabbos dinner at the Kinos. Two, two years ago, I came to, a year and a half ago, I came to the Kinos, and I wanted to get my son a cell phone. So I figured I'll just go to the tag office and get my kid's phone tagged. I found out there's no tag office. Okay, I had to go to Williamsburg, try finding parking in Williamsburg. It, it wasn't easy. I got a drive to Williamsburg, I get my uh, kid's phone tagged, and I come back to Grand Heights, and I was sitting in someone's house, and I was uh, venting. I said, you know, what is this place? This is Crown Heights. This is the Debbie Shkona, and I have to go in Williamsburg to get my phone tagged. I was very embarrassed as a Lubavitcher to rock up in Williamsburg, and he says, where was yours? I, have, I live in Wisconsin. I don't know. I, I didn't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I, I don't know. I talked to the rabbis. He gave me a speech for half an hour, and every word was right, but I didn't want to hear it, so I didn't hear it. But... Now, I went to the family. I told the family in Grand Heights. I said, by the way, how frustrating it was. They tell me, what do you mean? We're Lubavitch. We don't filter our phones. And I'm like, what? I, I, it wasn't just me. The whole table. These aren't good people, fine dimension. And I was sitting there. I thought, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I am crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? I, I, I remember, I, I'm just quiet. I'm never quiet for anything. And I was like, you know, I know it's challenging. I know it's challenging. But today I gave the kids an example. They don't like it. But I said, guys, if your parents really want you to be safe. However, imagine they all gave you a loaded pistol and told you, go to, go, go to yeshiva. Go to, go to school with a loaded pistol. Just don't shoot anybody. Be careful. I trust you, Ankle. Don't shoot anybody. They all started laughing, of course. Like, what are you laughing about? Your parents trust you. What do you mean? They're not going to shoot your friend. If we don't take simple steps, simple steps, it's not going to work. You know, it's interesting. There, 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 are two, there are two things that stick in our heads as, as, as kids years later. There's the idea of learning Torah, the idea of doing mitzvahs, also the idea of Mesedas Nefesh. I remember as a kid, random story, but I'll give you an example. My mother, she had to go to Manhattan. She had to get, I think, a bunch of her wisdom teeth taken out, those two or three, whatever it was, I'll never forget. And she went to Manhattan, got her, got, had her teeth pulled. I remember she was telling me, you know, she came home and she said, I said, what happened today? I went to get my teeth pulled and I was trying to go back to the subway and I was getting very, very woozy. The doctor said, you have to eat within 30 minutes, something soft for your teeth. She went to get, uh, she sees, all she sees is halavakum, hagen does, this, that. So what does she do? So I said, so Ma, what do you do? She said, I got very, very woozy and I'm allowed to, right? I said, yeah. But then she tells me, you know, I couldn't do it. I went and bought three Gerber's baby food instead. And I remember, why am I sharing this story? You know, these things of Mesir Nefesh last forever. You can give your kid a speech all you want, but showing your kids that we take serious steps to be from Eden, these ideas last. So if your kids see how much we, we take a step with, with tagging everything, or whatever it is, I'm not speaking which companies, but the idea of I take this seriously, Lastly, am I good? lastly, I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we have when kids, I often bring everywhere, and 
I don't forget, I maybe get in trouble with this. I think we don't teach kids. I don't teach, I try to teach kids, but how beautiful the phone is. How amazing a cell phone is. Not that you have to teach it at a young age. I'm not going there, but we have high school kids who have cell phones. Nobody told the high school kid how much they can learn. We have such smart kids. I gotta tell you, I've over the years I had hundreds come through boys, girls, and through our Chabad house, through our shul, through our Shabbos table. They're very, very smart. You know something? Do you know who, who has the most? The, our best girls, our best girls get most of their influence. Matt Walsh, Ben Shapiro, Candice Owens. Those are our best ones. They have, they have their attention of our kids like you can't imagine. You know, I had a meeting with a Bacher recently, uh, recently telling me he left Yeshiva. I'm like, why? I have to find my true self. I said, you learned that from, uh, you know, Friedman all of a sudden, or... More tartel? Uh, who, who exactly did you learn this from? There are influences that are going into our kids. Into our kids are good kids. They're all good kids, but our kids who quote unquote have the blocks. There are influences going in that I don't think we're careful of. We have to teach the kids, our children, the teenagers. There's so much out there. You know, we had we, we had like seven years ago, a while back, we had a group of counselors that weren't the counselors we were used to. In our camp, Baruch Hashem, over in our day camp, we had really, really, really uh, fine girls. And one year, whatever reason, the girls that came, they said, Rabbi, you picked the wrong group, didn't you? I'm like, no, I didn't. I got to show them. And two weeks into camp, it was very, very, it was hard. So we had, we had a bring in, we had, we, as we always do on Shabbos afternoon, my wife and I. And we said, I said to them, listen up, we're going to try a social experiment. What's a social experiment? You guys are brilliant. I am offering now, any girl who commits to learning Chayenu for one month, I am buying a year's worth, of, I buy them a, subscri a, a, a subscription. For Chayenu. The whole discussion, the deal is, for 30 days, you have to do Chomish, Perik Echad, and Tanya. That's the deal. Eight out of 12 girls went. I am telling you, what I saw the next month of a summer, the Edelkeit, the refinement, the conversation by the supper table. These are smart, intelligent girls. And I quote one of them, Rabbi, I didn't know about this. No one ever told me. No one ever told me how geschmack it is. And for a full month, every single night, and I want to hear right now, most of that, many of, the, many of these girls are shluchos right now. They're all Baruch Hashem, Yiddish mothers, Siddish mothers. It's not because of that moment, but I think that what they learned that day was they're, they're worth more. They're worth more. Kids don't understand how much they're worth. The kids walk around with garbage in their ears. No one ever told them. You know, in my house, we uh, often if I bring in, and I... I was in the yeshiva once, and I was telling them, I love shalos and trumpets. I was giving examples. Like, Rabbi, where do you get this stuff? I said, you have a smartphone? There's, a, there's, Rabbi, there's Rabbi A, Rabbi B. There's a Torah cafe in Chabad.org. Rabbi Jacobson, Rabbi Patiyol. Uh, o U Y U. Don't a minute. I said, they're like, really? Yeah, it's all there. Teach them. The girls who come to our house and run to this set of headlines books that I have. Push it. They want to. We have to. You know, I don't think we understand how smart our kids are. We let them get away. With boys, it's a little bit easier. But with girls, I don't know what we're doing. That we think these girls are second-class citizens just because of the Hector. We have no right to treat them like this. Okay? They are smart. They're intelligent. And somehow they got the feeling better to, to learn, to, to hear uh, Ben Shapiro every day than to hear Perik Echad Rambam. Because you should learn safe from mitzvahs. Our kids are exposed to garbage day and night. The least we can do is sit down with our daughters and have a conversation. Have us a, how much is out there? Learn with Tati, learn with Mommy. Yet, this is the reality. No one is teaching them that this is real. I'm not here to give Moser. I have three teenagers myself. And this is what I deal with on a regular basis. I'm Kat Shalom when I ask Mechila. If not, uh, my bad. But I want to end off with, with two things. One, this is very doable. This is very doable. We take this seriously. This is very, very doable. To have a connection to a kinder, it's really, really real. You know, I don't know, I don't know. Sometimes we try our hardest, and it's a gate nisht. It's a gate nisht. You're right. Sometimes we're the best, amazing parents, and it's a push, it's a gate nisht. I'm going to share with you one thing in conclusion. My father, my father, Oliver Shalom, was an assistant principal in Olitera. He passed away in Amatsoya Shabbos 30, 30, 30, almost 34 years ago. <sighs> we finished Shiva on Friday. That Sunday went by dollars. 
My mother came by the Rebbe. My mother was clearly distraught. Four little kids, challenging kids. She tells the Rebbe in Yiddish, Rebbe, my kinder habanish kentate. My kinder habanish kentate. Now blinking an eye, the Rebbe looks at her and says, Vinish abashemayim is erefater. Vizenish vagesen. My mother told the Rebbe, my kids have no father. The Rebbe told her, God in heaven is their father and I'll never forget them. I could tell you all the years later, we, sof ko sof, we didn't, my mini 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 the Abishai never ever forgets us. We do our part. We do our one step, a little step. And the step, I can give you a list of ideas, but we don't need them. Everyone has one step they can take. And I, I promise the Abishai will do his part. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Avrami Shapiro. The event is almost over. A couple of announcements and a short video. Number one, in your bags, you have this beautiful booklet that was put together, worked on with amazing resources. And I want to go off script for a minute and thank the organization MUST for putting together a beautiful magazine that was delivered to all of our homes. And uh, if you have this and that together, you have a lot of ideas and a lot of tools, a lot of resources how to start working on this. Number two, I just want to thank everybody who was involved, and I hope I don't miss anybody. I want to thank Dr. Shapiro, thank Rabbi Avrami Shapiro, thank you Yaakov Berman, NCFJE, thank you to a group of mothers who are out here, thank you to Rabbi Benny Wolf from Beis Rivka. thank you to all the schools for joining, thank you to Mrs. Blau from Beis Rivka. to Ms. Lieberson, Ms. Klein, and the Beis Rivka development team, thank you to Mrs. Rabisky, Ms. Eisenbach, Rabbi Yassi Brisky for putting together the resource sphere, and Ms. Ehrenreich. When the video is over, when the video is over, please make sure to take this with you, and the men should please exit through the door and go out to New York, East New York Avenue, and it will be the time for the women's resource sphere. We will watch a video. We will... Reflect, connect, and protect. We spoke about it, we heard all about it, and now it's time for action. Please pay attention to this video. One action is worth more than a thousand sighs. Parents of Crown Heights, it's time for action. Let's hear about steps people have taken to combat technology usage in their own homes. Real parents, real solutions. I realize that the only way I'm going to get my kids on board with limiting technology is if I lead by example. So I started shutting my phone off for a few hours when my kids come home from school. It was torturous at first, but my kids have felt the difference so strongly that I wouldn't go back for the world. I changed the visual display on my screen to black and white to make it less enticing for me. As the life's mission of every chassid, my wife and myself invest tirelessly to imbue our home with all the values of chassidus and saturate our home with Torah, Mitzvah, Kedusha. And therefore, it's worth every dime we invested in buying the tag filters for each device, even the time and hassle of fine-tuning each one based on its needs. It's all worth it to uphold the standards of Kedusha in our home. Our children know our devices are a safeguard and we don't rely on ourselves. In a world out there, we definitely need the safeguarding of Yichud in the world of technology as well. My kids know that there are times that I put my phone on silent or do not disturb. They witness firsthand how I do my best to control my phone and not let my phone control me. I have an accountability partner. Every day for two hours, we put away our phones. Okay, so I know this might sound a little bit extreme, but I actually leave my phone at work. I have a cheaper phone with a number that only my wife knows just for emergencies. And what can I say? It's been the greatest gift for me ever. I have an app called Digital Detox. I can set challenges for myself with it. I can decide when I want my phone to automatically lock, which apps I can open or lock during specific hours. And the best part is, if I want to quit the challenge, I need to pay to unlock it. My friends and family know that I set times to check my phone. When I'm responding to messages, I try to stay focused and respond to people intentionally. My WhatsApp notifications are off. I only see messages if I make the conscious decision to open my phone and look at them. Okay, so this is a game changer. I got an Apple Watch. Wherever I am in the house, I get calls and texts and important notifications, but my actual phone just stays by the charger when I'm home. My screen time has never been so low. I went and bought myself and my teens a physical alarm clock so that we don't need phones in the rooms by night. My wife and I designated certain areas in our house as no phone zones, and that includes bedrooms. 
even for charging. I saw with my own eyes how my teens slept so much better. My kids know this very well. We use devices only in public areas and no phones allowed by meals, ever. Our family computer is in the middle of the living room. And there's a filter with time limits and it reports on all activity. We install tag filters on all devices. So, so worth it. Only Mommy and Tati know the password to the tablet. Internet is off limits unless with a parent around and only for research or school projects. I was super excited to see that the tech clock filter is now available for Android phones. I had such a great experience using it for the computer and laptops. We actually have a specific time. I won't say what time because it really depends on each family and what works for that family that the entire internet shuts off. So as passionate as I am about keeping my kids safe from technology, I'm afraid that passion alone won't do it. We need solutions. I see must as a practical solution to a big problem. And Baruch Hashem, I'm so happy to say that we've set up successful class packs in three of my kids' classes. Because my home has no screen time, I make an extra effort to make my home the fun house that everyone wants to come to. We decorate, we have fun love Malka, we do fun crafts and activities. Instead of just restricting, which is so important, I also want my kids to feel like they have something extra and even more fun and excitement. After supper, my mommy puts away her phone and reads us a book. And that's my best part of the day. It gets confusing, it really does. My kids ask me questions like, what's the problem with this? And everyone has it. And they tell me, you don't even know what it's like to grow up without WhatsApp. And sometimes I really don't know what to say. That's why I'm so grateful to have a technology mushbia to ask all my questions to. It's been life-changing to have someone to help me see things clearly and help my husband and I make the decisions that work best for our family. My kids are relying on me to be a parent with a backbone. I don't want to let them down and even more than I can't afford to. That's why I set limits. They opened up. They told us their solutions. Now it's your turn. Tonight, right here. Can you choose something? Let's stop sighing. Let's start doing for ourselves, for our children, for our community. And together, we'll watch the change unfold.